Welcome to Prez's first ever fireside chat. Today I have my friend Stephanie, aka Nerdy D, with me here. Uh, and we are going to be talking about a topic that you picked out. And what would that be, Stephanie? Say hi to the people. Hello, everyone. I'm Stephanie, so it's nice to meet you all and talk with you today. Um, so the topic for today is going to be the video game that made the most impact on your life. So, uh, for anyone watching this, this is the first ever Prez's Fireside Chats. I'm going to be inviting guests on, they'll pick the topic, and we'll just have a friendly discussion about it. As you heard, Steph picked the, the topic of what game had the most impact on us. Now, Steph, I'm going to... Take a guess here after like playing some MMOs with you. Is yours Legend of Zelda? So Legend of Zelda is um, the first video game that I ever played. So it does have a special meaning in my heart. I even have a touch of the Triforce. But um, it is not the game that made the most impact. Oh, then what game made the most impact on you? That, that would be Halo 2. Really? I actually did not expect that. Because I remember we were playing Black Desert and you are talking talking a lot about uh, Link being your like best boy and your first video game crush and everything. Yes, and Link, like I said, he always holds a special place in my heart. But when it comes to making the most impact in really like a video game that changed my life, it absolutely was Halo 2. Okay, uh, and why is that? So, um, a little bit of backstory here. I was homeschooled from sixth grade until I graduated high school. So, if you can imagine, I didn't, you know, have a whole lot of people that I was talking to, you know, one-on-one. -on -one. Um, so, I, you know, talked to some friends that I knew from church and they were like, oh, you know, play Halo 2, which you don't think about church and, you know, a first-person shooter, <laughs> but <laughs> um, uh, they did. And they're like, you gotta play, you gotta buy it. So... Somehow I magically convinced my parents to buy an Xbox and then Halo 2. And oh, so Halo was that game that you actually convinced your parents to get it for? Yeah. No, I mean, like, we'd been, like I said, we'd had games and stuff and played Pokemon and things. It was the first first-person shooter that they allowed us to get. But um, what happened was I got it and I got Xbox Live. And I was playing with my friends one day. And we were in this uh, room waiting for a matchmaking session, and I saw a bunch of people with, you know, remember at the time back in the day when you, you were in a clan and you had, like, the tag had your clan in it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. I kept seeing PMS, and I was like, what in the hell is this? Please <laughs> like, tell me it stands for something other than what I'm thinking it stands for. It does. It is Pandora's Mighty Soldiers. Um, it is a clan that still exists to this day. Um, they were started by Athena and Athena Twin. The reason I know this, I found them, I googled them, and I was like, oh, it's the world's largest female gaming clan. So I found it, I searched it, um, and I ended up being like, okay, I have nothing better to do with my life. <laughs> like, let's just try it out. Yeah, let's just join I mean, it was. <laughs> I know, right? Um, so I joined and i was like or like uh, you know i had to go in and i filled out paperwork like online and stuff in, in their forums and they were like okay so you have to try out like it wasn't a thing where you just got into the clan like you had to try out oh there was like hardcore ones oh yeah no so like we had to do you remember i don't know if you played did you play halo 2 at all uh not too much i was more of a playstation boy understandable i'm an xbox girl through and through but understandable i i like ps4s and all the playstation stuff as well but um with with uh halo 2 there is a level that looks like a boxing ring essentially and in order to get into the clan you had to do this thing where you did a bxr which means you hit bxr quickly and it was a special move that it would do where you would instantly kill someone so to get in, you had to be XR a certain number of times. You had to know all of the callouts for all of the maps. I mean, it was insane because, like, they had tiers levels. So if you were on alpha team, it meant you were, like, the pro. Like, that was the people who went to, you know, all the gaming stuff and did all the big wig stuff. You had Bravo and Charlie, so on and so forth. Well, I apparently did so good I got into Bravo. So <laughs> oh. it has changed my life. Like, um... I got to play Halo 4 because of that um, testing it. I got to play it with Microsoft. Um, really? To, yeah, because they, you know, we were friends with them. 
like we knew them. So they were like, oh, hey, you know, the crackdown beta came out and is coming out two weeks from now, but we want to do an alpha. So they had all of us hop on one night and we just played with the, you know, all the people. I remember like when things shot backwards, like they weren't supposed to. And then, you know, I've played with Fatality before um, and it just changed my life. Like Athena, like in Athena Twin, they work, I believe both of them still do. Don't quote me on this, but <laughs> I know one of them still works for Twitch. I don't have to. I don't have to quote you. You're quoting yourself right now, live. I know, right? <laughs> so, but you know, <laughs> but that's, yeah. So it changed my life. That's I got to actually some cool really incredible. Can Can you explain to me what you mean by like the whole Bravo Charlie stuff? As someone who's like not too familiar. So they were just that was uh, your groups. So of course you can't have at the time there was you know thousands of people in the clan. So you can't have a thousand people in one matchmaking session. You can only have a certain number. So what they did was you had teams and your teams were determined by like how good you were and things like that. So you would like practice and you'd have practice times. And depending on how good you were, if you were, you know, wanting to be pro, you'd be an alpha. If you wanted to like almost be pro, like if you're working that way, you'd be in Bravo. Um, and then Charlie was like, you know, so on and so forth. And it was just like, you had your own team of girls that played with you. Like that was your team. We had a leader, like our captain, um, that would handle all of the times we would train. I mean, we had, um, oh, 30 okay. minutes to an hour practices, like almost every night, that kind of stuff. So as, as like an anime geek, it's more like, uh, like you had your fairy tale guild, but then you had your, your designated team. Exactly. Yes, exactly. Okay, that's actually really cool. And would you say this was the game that you probably like put the most time into back then? Oh yeah, no, absolutely. I think I sunk, oh my gosh. I mean, because of you know, practicing and then we do other stuff, I probably put thousands upon thousands of hours into that game. See, for me it's weird because the game that had the most impact on me was probably not the one I put the most time into. Mm -hmm. It was just like a really good playthrough. So, uh, also again, I'm I'm really surprised that I, I was like sure that yours was gonna be Legend of Zelda, <laughs> but that's really cool. You actually got got to play with Microsoft and test stuff out. That that actually took you a ways. Oh yeah, no, absolutely, and that's why I say like you know, <laughs> yes, Zelda was what made me a gamer because had I not played it, I wouldn't have. Um, but other than that, like Halo was the one it made the most impact because it changed my life like i had people to socialize with i made some incredible friends and everything so yep there are definitely games like that like when you get into a community that's what really gets you not just the game itself but getting to know the people and having these regular people to kind of hang out with um mm -hmm, exactly when i was like in my like really like thick mmo days I used to play a game called Rumble Fighter a lot, like as far as MMOs go, and I was like in there a lot, had a regular group of friends, but then I fell out because those people that were in the community took things a little too seriously. There, there was a lot of drama, like like a lot mm -hmm. of e dating, people talking behind people's backs. I'm like, ah, oh, oh yeah, too much. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, so yeah, my my thing for can you take a guess at what my game is? Oh goodness. Um okay, well you say like PlayStation. Was it Final Fantasy? Close. Uh, but which one? Okay, look, I I have <laughs> never played a Final Fantasy nope. game. Don't kill me as a gamer. I know I should have, but I've actually never played one. I take that back. I played the newest one for like twenty minutes and <laughs> I just can't play them. It's it's okay because like you you, I, I said I, I didn't know too much of Halo, so it's okay. We both exposed each other. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, it's not a game that I put the most time into. It's not the first game I played or anything. I'd like to give you some background. Uh, my first gaming experiences were back in arcades. Mm -hmm. Like, that's what I grew, grew into. Uh, I, I played a lot of the fighting games really drew me in, in particular. Like, I remember mm -hmm. it was Tekken 2 or 1, and I just, like, kept going back to the arcades, putting more and more quarters in. Like, when my parents were busy, they just needed to drop me for, like, five minutes with my uncle or something. we just hop on down to the arcade, and I would always, like, end up going to, like, Street Fighter or Tekken or something. Tekken's the one that, like, stuck with me through the years. And I think that arcade experience is the main reason I like fighting games today as much as I do. Mm -hmm. Like, 
it just carried over. You know, you kind of grow into what you start with. Um, oh yeah, absolutely. But as far as like games, I put the most time into. That would either be that one of two Digimon games on the PS One actually. <laughs> Uh, Digimon Digital Card Battle on the PS1. I played that. It was like a card game kind of deal where like the monsters would come out of the cards. You'd pick different attacks and stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I didn't have a memory card back then. Oh, so, no. So it was one of those games where like I would leave the PlayStation on for days at a time. And then eventually like, one day like my parents might turn it off or there'd be a power surge or something. So I ended up putting oh, the most time into that because of how many times I'd restart and get stuck. Oh my gosh, I can only imagine all that work and then it just gone. Oh, and it gets worse though. Because I was oh. I, I have very stupid gamer moments. Like <laughs> like very stupid. So in the Digimon card battle game, uh it would be basically you have to knock out three of the opponents' Digimon that they play. And mm-hmm. you would have every monster has three different attacks. They have their like strongest attack, their medium attack, and their special attack, which is the weakest, but it sometimes has a special ability attached. Mm-hmm. You pull up a menu and be like, oh, press circle, triangle, or X to decide which attack you're going to use. Uh, so my dumb self never realized how to properly do that and would always press X first to get, and thinking that would get him into a menu. And then he would, I'd never be able to use the circle or triangle. So I made that game way harder than it ever had to be by constantly using nothing but the weakest attack. <laughs> Oh no! Eventually, I beat it somehow doing that, and I didn't realize it until I was in high school. And I dug it up, and I tried again. I'm like, I'm an I'm an idiot. The amount of time <laughs> I put into this and the amount of struggles I had is all because I'm stupid. <laughs> oh my gosh, that sounds like something I would absolutely do. Like hands down, that that's something that would be in my repertoire of things that would happen. <laughs> and then the other Digimon game that I put a lot of time into was World Three, which was like. The first like standard turn-based RPG that really hooked me because there's a lot of variability, a lot of like fun stuff going on. You were basically in like an SAO type situation mm-hmm. where like you were in a video game world and then you couldn't log out, so your character goes adventuring around, uh, figuring out what's going on with the hackers and stuff. But uh... oh, that is really cool. I'm also gonna be honest. I'm really disappointed in myself because I was a huge Digimon fan, and the fact that I didn't know these games existed. I'm like internally punishing myself right now. Like, how did you not know these existed as a Digimon fan? Oh yeah, Digimon World Three was amazing. I'm actually like running an emulator sometimes to play it now because like it's a game that's fantastic to go back to. Card Battle I'll was have... really good too. I'm gonna have to look it up for sure because that sounds like so much fun. Oh, have you tried the latest ones, uh, the Cyber Sleuth series on PS4? I have not. Again, I like I have a PS4. I have two. But, right. uh, you know, I'm still an Xbox person. I guess it's just ingrained in me. It's like, cool. I know that PlayStation has trophies, but it's the achievement, that satisfaction <laughs> of having that achievement thing. <laughs> Say, like, achievement unlocked, to me, will always just be so, like, instant gratification. So it's hard for me to, like, look into the PS4 stuff. That, that's fair. For me, it's the PS4 games that draw me there. Uh, do you have a mm-hmm. Switch? I do. So here's the deal. The PlayStation, the Cyber Sleuth games, which is like the turn-based, like almost Pokemon style with a good story Digimon games, both of them are coming in a collection to Switch. Oh. So I would say definitely look into that. I think you'll really enjoy them, especially if you're since you more like to play on the Switch. Mm-hmm. Uh, those games are fantastic turn-based things with a good evolution web and decent story behind them. Uh, but I, I am re- way off track at this point. Uh, the game <laughs> that really impacted me was uh so everyone knows at least about the game final fantasy 7 right yes one with like cloud and stuff Mm -hmm. that's not the game it's actually the prequel that came out on the psp that is the game that probably got me the most it's called Mm. seven crisis core which is all about the story before cloud because he in, in seven for most of the game cloud thinks he's someone else and he keeps alluding to this person Oh, okay. And Crisis Core is all about that person. His name is Zach Fair. And huh. the reason I fell in love with this game and this character so much is in a time period uh, where all these RPG and story antagonists were super edgy. L- like Cloud is super edgy. Yeah. And uh, that's around where we're getting Jack and Daxter, a little ways after Jack and Daxter 3 when we had like Dev- 
evil mode and angel mode and uh, basically a lot of like more gritty, darker characters. Mm-hmm. A lot of edgelords going around. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The time where Sasuke was extra popular. Uh, <laughs> Zack was something entirely different. He was this super passionate, happy-go-lucky guy who you couldn't help but root for. And his whole thing was like he really wanted to become a hero. Like that was his big dream. And the game tore you apart because... From the get-go, you knew he wasn't going to survive this story. Because that's how Seven starts. Oh. See? No, that would be like... Oh, I'd play the whole game probably like crying. Like, no! It gets so much worse, though, because... So much awful stuff happens to Zack throughout the game. And it's a character you can't help but like and root for. And you really want to be his friend. Like... Oh my goodness. Uh, I'm just imagining. So a really famous character in Final Fantasy VII is Aerith. Uh, she's the mm-hmm. chick you always see get stabbed by Sephiroth. Yeah. At this point, guys, that's not a spoiler. If you don't know that by <laughs> now, that's on you. Too bad. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so she actually fell in love with Zack way before Cloud. And they had like mm-hmm. an ongoing romance. They were like cutely checking in on each other and stuff like that. And even at seven, the star seven, she's... I think she was still waiting on Zack for like years after he oh. passed away. And it was so bad because that giant buster sword, right? That Cloud carries around. Mm-hmm. That doesn't come from Cloud. Zack passed it on to Cloud and Zack got it from his mentor, Angeal, who turned into like yeah. this monster dude. And he always ref- refused to use the sword. He would always say, I don't want to get any rust on it because this is my sense of honor from my family. And then when he ends up leaving the organization and being mutated into a monster, he passes on to Zack, and Zack puts him down with his own honor, his own sword. And oh, then wow. when Zack is like, the final boss fight isn't fair in Crisis Core. Because after <laughs> all the awful stuff that happens, it's an endless minion wave fight. To the oh, point, like, like kind of uh, like a horde mode. Thing. Oh yeah, like, yeah. They just keep coming. They keep coming, and it got to the point where like I, I had I was using a cheat code for like infinite health, mm-hmm. and I, for like an hour straight they just kept coming, and eventually I just had to stop, and it ends so sadly, like because he just gets shot up and he's laying there bleeding. At this point, Ooh. Cloud's actually in a coma, and Zach's basically pulling him across the country, keeping them both safe as fugitives. Cloud's just now waking up, and he pulls himself, like, crawling towards Zack, barely with any of his memory left. And Zack passes on that sword, that honor, to Cloud, saying that you have to live for the both of us now. Oh. And so Cloud, this beautiful music plays called The Price of Freedom, as, Mm -hmm. uh... Zack's mentor showed up in like an angelic form to kind of pull him to heaven. And it ends with a cloud basically traveling along the desert, dragging the sword behind him, having no idea who he is. And this connection to Zack becomes so obsessive, he starts to think he is Zack because of the sword. Oh my goodness gracious. And that, that was the first game that like really hit me so hard emotionally. Like I, I, I'm not afraid to say I, I cried for that game. It was a beautiful experience, and it's what really solidified my love for RPGs and great storytelling. And it's been hard to find another game that can make you fall in love with a character like that. Even though you know what's at the end, you Mm -hmm. still want to defy all odds and be like, Man, I just want the best for this guy. Oh yeah, no, exactly. Like... I know what's going to happen, but I just want to put that in behind me and just make sure that he, because he is everything and like the light of the world and you just can't make it happen. Absolutely. Like uh, one last like touch about that. Uh, the famous girl, Aerith. Mm-hmm. Uh, like Zach finds her in like the underground town and she's too afraid to go above ground because she says the sky is too scary and overwhelming. So he helps her bring the sky and outside world to her by helping her garden flowers and stuff in the church and they end up selling flowers to the nearby people like on on dates and stuff 
and eventually does take her to see the outside world and it's just so nice and heartwarming but then you realize she's stuck waiting there forever because he's never oh. coming back no oh, oh my god like i'm like tearing up right now just hearing this like i can only imagine putting all the time and effort to play the game it's a long and, game like, too yeah oh like it it just is ripping me apart already i'm like i want to play this game now but at the same time it's... do i want to go through that and also it's on psp so it's such a pain to find now oh yeah no i've been trying to get a psp so i can play games like, like that and it's like one they're outrageous now because they've been all um, hacked been, well not all hacked but they've also been discontinued they're not making yep. them anymore so they're just a pain in the butt to find and they're expensive when you do yep and then the vita you can download some of the psp game and play on there but not all of them Mm -hmm. But uh, if you do want like to experience it, you can probably look up a cutscene movie on on YouTube or something. Oh, that's true. But it's super long. It's like three, four hours of cutscenes. Cool. Well, you know that is a Final Fantasy trademark. I feel like is if you're not playing, like if you don't have three hours worth of cutscene, you're not playing a Final Fantasy game. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, the, uh, Crisis Core is the name of the game, and it was a beautiful experience. Uh, I cannot mm -hmm. recommend it highly enough. If you are able to play that game, please do. Mm -hmm. uh, it's probably my favorite RPG of all time. Because there's not many games that get you emotionally connected in that way. Oh yeah, no, absolutely. I don't think for me there's been very many. I think the only game that's ever made me actually cry was Last of Us. Mm -hmm. That's another rough one, that, yeah. Yeah, no, that, that game I sobbed for like an hour. Uh, what, the most recent one that got to me was the Spider-Man game. That that uh, hit me really hard. I didn't play it. My husband did, but I know what happens. And I was like, if I had played this, I'd be like in the corner, huddled up, crying right now. Oh yeah, because like I I'm very close with like my mo my mother and my father. So mm -hmm. what happens at the end there? I I just couldn't help but think to myself, I'm like, Peter Peter Parker, you are a better man than I will ever be. I would have said, mm. forget the town, I'm a saver. Yep. Uh, well, I think that's all the time we have for today. Do you have any closing remarks? I don't, except for this has been a really fun experience talking to you about all this and getting to talk about video games. I don't get to do it that often, so I enjoy doing it. Oh, it's an absolute joy to have you on. Also, uh, do you want to tell everyone where they can find you and your opinions and loveliness? Yes, absolutely. So you all can follow me on Twitter. My handle is underscore nerdy, N-E-R-D-I-E-E. -E. And I'm also on YouTube with my YouTube channel. called Nerdy. That's it as well. The same thing, N-E-R-D-I-E-E. -E. And don't you got a blog as well? Oh, I do. It's nerdy.com. <laughs> it's just right. nerdy everything. <laughs> nerdy everything. Well, yeah, if it's nerdy, that's me. Thank you all for joining us today on the first ever uh, Fireside Chat. I hope you join us again. Uh, be sure to check out Nerdy's channel. She is an absolute delight to have around. I think you'll enjoy seeing her content. And always remember to harness the power of wholesome energy. Goodbye. <laughs>